Now, here's Michael Smirkanish. Indra Nui. Indra Nui served as CEO and chair of PepsiCo from 2006 through 2019. Now the author of My Life in Full, Work, Family, and Our Future. Terrific book, which I just poured through in the last couple of days. Thank you so much for being here. It's really an honor to have you on the program. Thank you for having me. And is that song saying that you're stuck in the middle with me? Well, we're stuck in the middle together, I hope. I mean, I feel like I know enough about you now from having watched your career, but also reading your memoir to know that you're a critical thinker and not someone who's tethered to ideology at one end of the political spectrum or the other. That's true. And somebody who loves the Steelers wheel and that song, too. (laughs) <laughs> wow. Whoa. The fact that you knew that it was Steelers wheel really curries favor with me. Although I know why you knew because you were in a band of your own. A uh-huh. long time ago. The only, I think the period in which music was at its best, the late sixties to sort of the early eighties, real music was played. I was part of that generation. I loved it. Okay, is this part of your preparation? I know how dialed in you are and that you're always well prepared. Did somebody tell you that you should say that to me because you knew that's exactly how I see the world? No, because in my home, I have every 70s music produced, including all the one head <laughs> wonders. And that's all I listen to, Michael. That's all I listen to. You know what I've been listening to again and again? Heart singing Stairway to Heaven at the Kennedy Center Honors. Oh my God, the Wilson <laughs> sisters. Oh, my God. They give me uh, goosebumps every time they sing it. I love those sisters. I don't know if if you've ever seen them live. You probably were at the Kennedy Center. I I have seen the Wilson sisters live, and I I love them, and I love Dreamboat Annie. How's that for a name check? But, you know, you've got to watch this video because when the choir comes to the back, I mean, you start to tear up because it's so powerful, the song and the bass, better than the original by Led Zepp, I'm going to say. Okay, I'm not sure about that. You had me up until then. All right, listen, here's my favorite story in the book. My favorite story in the book is on page 158. I was over the moon. This was major. President of PepsiCo, the board of directors. Wow. I packed up at work immediately. You went home, and what happened next? Well, it was about 10 o'clock in the night, and I pulled into the house and... uh, you know, sort of bounced up to tell my family about it, realized my husband had gone to bed. My mother greeted me at the top of the stairs and she said, um, I said, mom, I got great news for you. She said, I don't want to hear any news. Go out and get the milk. I said, it's 10 o'clock in the night. What do you mean get milk? Why didn't you have my husband get the milk when he came in? Oh, he looked tired. You go get the milk. So I was, to be honest, quite upset because I thought she should have taken the time to listen to me, whatever the news was. I went out and got the milk as any dutiful daughter does, banged it on the countertop. And I said, I just got announced. I mean, I was just told I'm going to be president on the board of directors. That is incredible news, mom. She said, hey, stop right there. I don't care if you're president on the board. I don't even know what that means. But when you walk into this house, you're the mother, you're the daughter, the wife, the daughter-in-law, whatever roles you play at home, just leave your crown in the garage. That's what she said to me. I was, to be honest, pissed off. I was, because I said, hey, I should be allowed to celebrate. But later on, I came to realize that the roles that I play at home are totally different than the roles I play when I enter PepsiCo. In fact, I cannot dismiss myself or divorce myself from the roles that I have at home as mother and wife and daughter and daughter-in-law. So I have to balance power and humility in profound ways. That's the big lesson and takeaway. But doesn't that story provide a synopsis of what the whole book is really about, the tension, the balance that you were going through of of being on this incredible career path and having familial responsibilities, taking care of, of aging or ill relatives and your husband and your daughters, and somehow trying to get it all done. I think the answer is yes to that, but the big advantage I had is I had an equal partner and my husband. We both were working. Right but we both were committed to the marriage. We both were committed to the family and we decided we are in it together. So we both somehow made it happen with the help of a big support structure. But many people don't have that, Michael. Therein lies the rub because I had family to support me. I had an ecosystem around me to support me. Later on in life, I had the financial resources to buy support and help 
Uh, but many people don't have uh, a spouse that you know, contributes equally to the family uh, chores and they don't have the support structure. And therein lies the problem for young family builders and mothers in particular. Your career so noteworthy for you so often being the first female. And I just made a couple of notes because it's a Mm. long list, but the ones that stand out in my mind in 14 years as a consultant and corporate strategist, you never had a female boss. When you walked in the door at PepsiCo, white American men held 15 of the top 15 jobs at BCG, Boston Consulting Group. You never had a female client. In 1994, the number of female CEOs among the 500 biggest companies, zero. How hard was it for you continually to be the first? Um, You know, it's not just being a woman, immigrant from an uh, emerging market, colored female. So I had every strike you could count against me, theoretically. But it was interesting that I did my part, which is, I worked hard, worked very, very hard. I overprepared for every meeting because I assumed when people met me, they put me in a hole, wondering why I even had a right to be in the room where decisions were made. So in my mind, I put myself in a hole because that's what I assumed people were doing to me. And I realized I had to dig myself out of the hole and then do well. And so I overprepared for everything. And then the amazing thing happened, Michael. I had so many mentors who stepped up and said, we like what we're saying. We're going to promote her. We're going to develop her. We're going to push her along, pull her along. And so in my life, I am a product of mentorship, incredible mentorship. Right. Not, but not just mentorship, mentorship. And I was going to get there next by men, by men. Continually, there were men who, who figuratively took you under their wing. I'll tell you another story that I loved in the book. You need a student visa application which requires the approval of Officer Todd. Who was Officer Todd and what happened as you stood in line? You know where I'm going with this. Oh, yeah. So James Todd was the uh, visa officer in the uh, American consulate in Madras in India. And every day they only gave out 50 visas. There'd be hundreds of students applying. This is way back in 1978. So you had to stand in line all night to get a token to actually go in and go for the visa interview. And, um, you know, I was the only woman in the line. I was stood in line from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. And my bosses in the company that I was working for came all through the night with flasks of coffee or a snack so that I wouldn't be all by myself, hungry or thirsty. I was touched. In fact, one of them called me about two weeks ago to say, I'm surprised you remembered all those stories. And I'm so glad oh my gosh. I, had a, oh. I, had a, I had a little part to play in your success. Uh, the BCG Chicago office, Carl Stern, is your boss. And unfortunately, your father back in India is in an accident, I think on a Vespa when he gets hit. He says, take off up to six months to care for your dad. Unprecedented, right? Unheard of at the time. Yeah, it was when my dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. I brought oh, him to the okay. U.S., I brought him to the U.S., but I didn't know what paid leave was. And I was too new in BCG to even ask for leave, leave alone paid leave. Uh, my husband was in graduate school at that time. And I just get a call from Carl Stern saying, Indra, uh, I know that you are uh, with your father now and he's you know, going to pass away because it's terminal. Uh, BCG and I have decided to give you a six months time off with pay. And I mean, I started to weep because this is unprecedented. We were struggling to figure out how we were going to make it all happen. And that he gave it to me was just, I asked him a few months ago, I said, Carl, why did you do it? Why did you give me leave? He said, that was the right thing to do. It was a human thing to do. You say in the book, mine is not the immigrant story of hardship. And yet you tell stories like, I love this. When you're at Yale, you go to, is it pronounced Kresge's? With $50? Why are you at Kresge's with $50 in your pocket? I have to go for an interview to get a summer job. And uh, I don't have any clothes to wear that are interview worthy. But I only have 50 bucks. And the only store that has a suit for 50 bucks is Kresge's, which is later on Kmart. And I buy the most god-awful outfit. outfit. I show up and people are in sort of a sartorial seizure, wondering what creature just walked in. But it's got a wonderful ending, Michael, because I go through the interview. 
I sit up straight and I answer the questions to the best of my ability. The company in Silco makes one offer that day at the end of the interview process, and that was to me. And I was blown away because just on the basis of how I dressed, they should have eliminated me right away. And I got a first dose of what I think is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful about our country, a meritocracy, that people are valued for what they can contribute, uh, not for what they look like or how they dress. And right through my life, that has been my experience. And I am a unique product of the environment that exists in the United States. I learned so much in your book about so many different things, but not the least of which is Indian culture, about mm. which I know embarrassingly little. Mm. But I appreciate this fact. It seems that your parents were very atypical insofar as they were constantly promoting you and suggesting to you that there was no limit to how far you could go to pursue your dreams and aspirations. Well, you know, I had an older sister, myself, and a younger brother. Uh, we grew up in a family and a, a community where typically the girls got married at age 18. And right. the men were all encouraged to study. My father and my grandfather basically said, our, do our daughter, granddaughters are going to study as much as they want. It's their choice. We're going to help them along. We're going to pay for all the tuitions, but they are going to study. And my mother, who didn't have the opportunity to go to college, basically lived her life vicariously through the daughters. She had one foot on the brake saying, community expects me to get you married at 18. One foot on the accelerator saying, dream big. So I lived with this duality of the brake and the accelerator. <laughs> and the good news is the accelerator won out, Michael. Indra, the, uh, the other thing that amazes me about your career and another shortcoming of mine, how little I've appreciated the world of consulting. Mm. In your case, you had to become knowledgeable, expert even, in such diverse products and services as the marketing of stay-free feminine protection in India, mm. industrial HVAC citrus processing, bottling equipment, sweeteners, two-way radios and semiconductors, and satellites for government use, power generation, and industrial equipment. And in each one of these examples, you would have to literally and figuratively roll up your sleeves and immerse yourself in the subject matter, becoming sufficiently expert that you could tell individuals what they were doing wrong in their business, their big businesses. Well, the difference with consultants is that you don't tell them what's wrong with the way they engineer the products or, you know, down to uh, technical details, but you have to understand the business to be able to understand the value drivers of the business so that you can now tell them what they're doing right or wrong about the strategic value drivers of the business. Very many people in consulting try to skate through consulting without getting into the detail. I worked for a firm, BCG, that basically said, you have to understand the industry cold before you can be a legitimate consultant. So they taught me what good consulting was all about. And I loved it. You know, I mentioned in the book that I'm wired kind of differently, Michael. Any topic I get into, I dig deep. I zoom in before I zoom out. And so I actually enjoy and love getting into the details. And that's what I enjoy doing in consulting and in all the jobs I've had. In all those jobs, it took great time away from your family. You've already expressed. And by the way, I'm, I'm not going to give away the whole book for free. I promise. <laughs> the book is terrific. It's called My Life in Full. Indra Nui, the former chair and CEO of, of PepsiCo, is my guest. Um, but it took a lot of time away from the families, including the raising of your daughters. Any regrets in that regard? Well, we didn't have all these technologies when I was growing up. didn't have the smartphone no Zoom, no FaceTime, none of that stuff. Had I had all that, there would have been a lot more balancing. In my case, between my husband, myself, and the extended family that sort of helped us out, we juggled all the priorities. Did I miss out on some of my kids' important moments? Yes. But again, remember, we were immigrants that came with nothing. So we were starting from ground zero. So we had to you know, keep working to be able to uh, you know, make enough money so that we could support ourselves and our children if we had to support them going forward. We tried to do our best, Michael, and we, we were very good parents, I must say. Our kids were never left alone. We always had a family member with the kids. And my husband and I, we coordinated our schedule so one of us was home every night. And I never missed a mother-daughter liturgy or a school program. I never missed any of that. 
in the beginning of the book, you say this is not a book for fixing how we mix work and family. But at the end of the book, you do offer a couple of tangible suggestions. Give us one. Give us all a takeaway as to how you were able to balance all of this and how we might learn from your experience. I had the help of multi-generational living because it's a very Asian thing to have multi-generations living under the same roof. That helped a lot. It has its tensions, but it helped a lot. A very supportive spouse, lots of mentors who also helped at home. I had a CEO, Steve Reinemann, who would offer to go pick up my daughter from school if I was too busy and my husband was traveling. So I had that support structure. But most importantly, as I moved up in corporate America, I had the financial resources to hire uh, you know, care, uh, care infrastructure at home for my kids. Uh, and so what I want to do and dedicate my time and energy going forward is really working with all of the organizations working on a childcare infrastructure to see how we can um, improve our childcare infrastructure, especially for the essential workers, especially for the essential workers who really are struggling with um, not having childcare, not being able to afford it. And even when it's there, it's not of high quality. And I think it's very important for young family builders and essential workers, we worry about this issue. You say that there's no single reason why more women don't lead big companies. Explain. There are multiple reasons why phenomenally talented women quit the job. They quit it because of unconscious bias in the workplace that still exists. They quit the job because there's no pay parity in many, many places where they wonder why for the same job they're getting paid much less. It sort of really saps their confidence. Uh, They quit because they just find it impossible to somehow make family and work possible because they don't have a childcare infrastructure, or worse still, when women are the primary caregivers for somebody ill at home or a sick child, there's no paid leave. So I think we're going to have to, you know, work through all of these issues. The good thing about COVID, it's taught us how to handle flexible working. And technologies have evolved so that it can make flexible working possible. But that's for the office worker. We still haven't solved the puzzle for the essential worker who has to show up. And so the answer is not one solution. It's a systems problem that has to be thought through very, very carefully. Indra, this has been wonderful. I thank you so much. There's a chart in the book, fun for you, better for you, good for you, about all of the products that at one time you were responsible for. Um, Unfortunately, I'm too often in the fun for you category, (laughs) which is Mountain Dew, Fritos, Pepsi, and Cheetos. (laughs) I spend some time in the Lipton baked lay chip uh, better for you and not enough time in the Tropicana Quaker Oats category. So I'm trying to improve. Okay, You've missed a lot, Michael. You should have all of them in balance. (laughs) And one last thing, I'll just tease the audience with this. The idea that you were the top individual at PepsiCo and that you would go out, I forget your word choice, I'll call it surveillance, but you would just go out and shop and show up and nobody knew who you were so that you could look at the product, fill your cart and have the experience that all of us have. I love those stories. Anyway, I wish you good things. My life in full is the book. Thank you for dropping by. Thank you for having me, Michael.